Good. All right. So welcome everyone to our very first, our inaugural of the fall 2022, uh, actually for the full school year. This is our inaugural uh, MRC, Maryland Robotics Center Symposium Series. And so, yay. Um, <laughs> all right. So uh, I am particularly excited uh, that we have Michael Tolley, professor, uh, associate professor from uh, mechanical and aerospace engineering from UC San Diego. Uh, I am personally a huge fan of his work. Uh, a lot of the times it's because I'll see his work and I'll be like, oh, I wish I had thought of that. <laughs> uh, and I have a few cases that you're going to see some of the stuff uh, that he'll be presenting where it is, you'll see there's a lot of, of similarities, but he was definitely the first one out with some of it. Um, and so really, uh, Michael's been a pioneer in a lot of robotics areas, but especially in terms of soft robotics. Um, and so there is a lot to uh, really appreciate about some of the really pioneering work that he has uh, developed. And so... Uh, without further ado, Michael. Thanks, Ryan. Um, so, yeah, for me, this is also my first in-person seminar in a few years, so it's really nice. Thank you so much for inviting me, and uh, Ryan and the other faculty here have been uh, great hosts so far. Um, so I'm very excited to talk about some of the work we've been doing in my group. Let me uh, give a little bit of my background, especially I see there's a lot of students here. Actually, first of all, who here is a PhD student, just for my information? Okay, cool. And who's a master's? And do we have undergrads as well? Okay, awesome. So really good mix. And I get the sense that we've got a mix of disciplines as well. Uh, so I thought I'd just give a little bit of my, my background um, uh, for, for those of you uh, who, who may not know. I'm originally from Canada, uh, from Kingston, Ontario, the first capital of Canada. This, of course was uh, the, the problem was that Kingston is right on the lake here, which is too close to the Yankees, so then we moved the capital back up to Ottawa to, uh, for, for defensive purposes. Um, <clears throat> I went to McGill uh, undergrad, and you know this is the photo that, that McGill shows when they're trying to attract American students, and we had a lot of fantastic American students. Of course, uh, a few months into the, the fall semester, it's looking something a little bit more like that. Um, you guys probably have some experience with some of this stuff around here. And uh, I went down to Cornell for my PhD. I worked with uh, primarily with Hod Lipson. Um, and I did a postdoc uh, in Boston. I worked mainly with Rob Wood, as well as we actually worked, collaborated closely with Daniela Roos at MIT. Um, and then finally, in 2014, I started at UC San Diego. Uh, the, this graphical story doesn't stop there. Uh, shortly after I started at UCSD, we founded the Contextual Robotics Institute, so we've been hiring faculty working in robotics in, in uh, a number of different disciplines and creating a center, <laughs> as you have here at UMD. And the thing that we're excited about right now is we're moving into, not from San Diego, but onto what used to be a parking lot on campus. Uh, we have this new building, Franklin Antonio Hall, named after uh, one of the um, uh, initial, one of the first employees at Qualcomm. And so we're actually, this says summer 22, we're moving in Tuesday. Uh, so these things keep getting delayed, but hopefully uh, but we're already starting to put some things in. So if you ever come visit, we'll be in this building. Um, okay, so anyways, that's an, enough about me, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Um, but what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, our work on soft robots, and by that I mean soft-bodied robots. And so the way I see soft robotics research is essentially taking away a fundamental assumption that for a long time uh, many people have made in robotics, which is the assumption of rigid bodies, right? So if you take an intro robotics, like mechanics of robotics class, I teach a class at UCSD, we go through forward kinematics, inverse kinematics, dynamics, control, things like that. The one assumption that we almost always make is that this is a mechanical structure made up of rigid bodies. And there's good reasons for that. So if you have um, actuators like motors, it's much easier to put those. I should have this video so it plays on a loop. It's much easier to put those motors at um, joints, right? Um, it's much easier to put sensors. Sensors up until very recently were very, very expensive. And so being able to have one sensor at each joint in order to fully define the, the configuration of your robot is very attractive uh, to a roboticist. And if you want to apply large forces or have uh, a lot of precision at the tip of a robot arm, you better um, be able to assume that there's zero deflection along the length of an arm, right? Or if you have a mobile platform 
with a manipulator on it, same sort of thing. You really want to be able to make these assumptions. Um, but if you look to uh, nature, to biological bodies, of course, we don't behave like this. We have skeletons, but between our bones, they're not pin joints. We're, we actually have complex cam mechanisms with meniscus in between. We have um, shock absorbers, we have muscles, we have tendons, things that absorb energy as we're moving through the world and then releasing them back as we run, which makes us particularly efficient, which is one of our superpowers as humans, right? It's one of the things that made, made humans so powerful is our ability to have a lot of endurance and sweat and those other things evolve. But anyways, the point is um, how can we bring some of these capabilities of uh, interesting material properties into robotics, and that's one of the things we've been thinking about. And potential applications being things like, you know, searching and rescuing a class building, inspection of a damaged nuclear power plant, assisting, assisting humans in daily tasks um, in a safe way, in an inherently safe way. Okay, so that was a video I took at a robot expo in Japan a, a few years ago, which is really cool if you ever get the chance to go. I strongly encourage it. Um, uh, as I say, if we look to nature, the one extreme example here is the octopus, where it has very few rigid structures. It has a, a rigid beak and, and some um, vestigial internal shell. They used to be mollusks, right? So evolved from mollusks, they used to have an external shell. They got rid of it because it was actually better, it was more beneficial for the octopus and the squid to, to be uh, mostly soft. And, you know, you have advantages like this, being able to squeeze through tight spaces. You can interact with fluids in interesting ways, as we'll talk about some more, etc. And so um, the idea here, uh, uh, at least what I'm excited about with soft robotics, is how can we gain some of these capabilities in our robotic systems? I mean, if we can make something like that, that's fantastic, but, you know, one step at a time, right? Um, okay, so I'm going to, these are some of the topics I'm going to talk about. I don't think we're going to have time to maybe go through all of this, but um, some of the things we've been thinking about is soft legs and how you can simplify walking. And um, we've also been thinking about embedding not just intelligence into the body in terms of, um, you know, soft structures, but actually uh, using fluidic circuits embedded in the body to control those structures. So it's a different kind of uh, intelligence that we embed into the body. We've thought about um, stiffness control and how we can improve manipulation and even make surgical tools with uh, controlled stiffness techniques. Uh, and then we've thought about swimming. Um, and also some adhesion, and depending on time, maybe we'll, we'll get to this. But there's a lot of groups who've been thinking about mobile soft robots. I'm excited about mobile soft robots because, again, I really like the idea of interacting the world, making something that can squeeze through tight spaces, et cetera. Um, we're not the only ones thinking about this. Here are some examples from back in 2015 when we wrote a review article, and since then, of course, there's been many other uh, groups doing exciting things as well. Um, <clears throat> One of my first efforts in this direction was, was working with Rob Wood uh, and George Whitesides, actually, at Harvard, and we made this giant pink soft robot. Um, I didn't order the silicone, by the way, so <laughs> if you have questions uh, about why it's like this color, you can talk to Rob Shepard. Um, but what we wanted to explore with this project was making a larger scale. They'd been making these small-scale soft robots. And the idea of how this works is very simple. You can sort of see a schematic on the top right. Um, you have some elastomeric body, some essentially rubber, and you are patterning this elastomeric body in some way to make it asymmetric. So in this case, if you, let's see if this, I don't know if the laser pointer won't work on the screen, but maybe I can do it over here. If I go, laser pointer. So if you look along the bottom of these legs, you have some sort of stiffer structure. It could be fibrous. Um, in this case, we use like a polyaramid fiber. And that prevents that part of the leg to, from expanding. When you inflate internal chambers, um, they're going to inflate, wrong mouse there, they're going to inflate just like a balloon. And then uh, you have this asymmetry because of the, layer, the strain limited layer on the bottom, so you get a bending actuator. That's the basic idea, and you can imagine there's all sorts of ways to make, if you pump fluid into a soft structure, you can program that structure so it can uh, move in different ways. Um, so using this very simple kind of bending actuator, we have six of them on this robot. The ones in the spine are essentially just inflated, and the other ones are inflating and deflating. Um, you get something that can move around the world. You can drive over the legs of this robot, and it can still get up and keep walking. It's very um, insensitive to temperature changes, so the stiffness of these uh, platinum-cured silicones are stable 
over a, a fairly wide range of temperatures. It can even survive uh, exposure to flames to some extent. And so really this was um, sort of showing off some of those uh, inherent capabilities of something that you might think of as being uh, not as good in other ways as a rigid robot. But this, I'm also showing this video just to highlight a lot of the challenges. Uh, so how do we make these things? Um, how do we make them faster? You'll see these videos were all accelerated, so it was moving very fairly slow. Um, how do we control? This is purely feed-forward, open-loop control. Um, sensing, I, I'm not going to talk too much about sensing today, but certainly there's a lot of work there uh, that we've done and others. And then uh, and thinking about underwater locomotion. Um, now, Ryan uh, invited me for the talk, and um, I think one of the uh, key enabling technologies right now for, for soft robotics is 3D printing. So we have traditional approaches uh, to making a, a soft body like um, molding. Um, even then, uh, we tend to 3D print a lot of the molds, although this is the ca a case where we used sort of laser cut pieces and assembled it, just because actually the robot was like this big and it's hard to find a 3D printer to, to print a nice mold that size. Um, but the capabilities coming on online with 3D printing and multi-material 3D printing are really exciting from my point of view in terms of um, the design space that they open up for manufacturing uh, soft robots or soft devices, right? So now we can print things. This is uh, an object connex polyjet machine, and uh, we've used this to print. You know, you can print over orders of magnitude in terms of stiffness. You can print bodies with soft and rigid components and even sort of gradations in between, which opens up uh, a lot of really exciting possibilities. Not everything that we do is 3D printed, but it's certainly empowering. So, you know, you might say, well, why are people excited about soft robotics now? I could mold rubber 100 years ago, I think, probably. I could roll, mold something like this. I don't know exactly when platinum cured uh, silicone was became popular. But, um, but I think it's really the, the capabilities with digital manufacturing, the understanding of materials, and our ability to, our computational ability to model uh, soft bodies much better than we could before are really coming together to make this um, uh, much more possible right now as a field. Okay, so uh, the one example with a 3D printed soft robot that we did, this was a few years ago, was create essentially a, instead of a planar bending actuator, something that could bend in space. And actually there's some very nice work from back in 92 from Suzumori in Japan who had made something similar with molding, but here we showed that we could do the same kind of thing with 3D printing. The challenge with the Connex machine that we were using, the material actually has a limited um, strand of failure as compared to something like a silicone. So we had to get a little bit more clever in terms of building some of the stiffness um, into the structure. So instead of just material uh, stiffness we're, we're, or softness, in this case uh, we have these, this bellowed shape which allows some more expansion. But then we can do some modeling and, and sort of predict how the tip of this thing is going to deform. And this is just an example where if you, we use a purely feed-forward control method uh, with, in this case, we have constant volume, so we're pushing air in and out of these syringes into this actuator. We can, um, you know, reasonably well control the, the tip position of this actuator to, for example, write UCSD on a board. Um, okay. But... The point here is, you know, the title of the talk was Mobile Robots. So, uh, so how can we then use this for mobile systems? The idea that we had was if we use these as the legs of a robot and we use a fairly um, basic uh, input uh, rotational pattern of these legs, um, could we handle sort of a wide variety of terrain? And um, I'm sort of skipping over uh, some of the details in the interest of time, but just to sort of get straight to the fun part, uh, on the left here, we have a robot that has essentially these, these exact same actuators as legs, and we put it on uh, some variety of terrain, rocks, pebbles, different inclined surfaces, and even constrained surfaces. And we found that with the same input, the same basic um, rhythmic input, uh, we were able to, to handle a wide variety. Um, so we thought this was pretty exciting. Um, Certainly, you could add a level of control on top, or I believe you could add a level of control on top of here. And we have some work in progress, actually, where we did some learning to come up with better gate patterns than these ones that we came up with by hand. Um, 
And again, you could add in sensing and start to do some feedback control, but just in terms of a feed forward open loop with a, with a basic actuation pattern, uh, the idea is you can already solve a lot of the problem with soft legs. Now the one on the right, this is um, more of a starfish kind of configuration, and so it's not quite as capable. But part of the reason I wanted to show this video was just this part at the beginning, which is, I get out of laser, point, laser pointer mode. Um, <clears throat> this sort of shows what's going on uh, behind the curtain, right? So we, you know, in some ways you can see videos of soft robots that look very attractive because you just have these tubes coming off. But then the, the part that you're not seeing is all the electronics and pneumatics on the side that are really enabling this thing. So in some sense, you have to consider all of this the robot which is also, by the way, my thought on a lot of micro robotics, but that's, I don't want to pick on, uh, on anyone. Um, but this is, uh, so, so then the next question is, how can we sort of build this control capability into this machine, and um, can we do it in a way that it, uh oh well, you can remind me tomorrow. <laughs> and can we do this uh, in a way where we can end up with a fairly simple machine? Uh, so in this case, obviously a lot of this complexity is that we want the freedom to, to control these gates and change them in various ways. Uh, but if we could settle on a single gate, could we build a simple sort of controller that can, that can build that into the mechanism? And the way that we, um, we were inspired by some nice work, again, from the Whitesides group after I left, uh, they started working on these um, bistable uh, valves. And they realized that actually you can use a bistable pneumatic soft elastomeric valve as like an inverter element in an electrical circuit. And so essentially these elements, if you hook them up in the right way, you can create a ring oscillator where each one is inhibiting the flow into the previous one, into the previous actuator. So you have three of these valves. You have three actuators, PA, P, C, PB, and PC, that are connected to um, uh, the ports on each on one of these valves and if you hook the circuit up the right way you provide a constant pressure to the entire circuit so this P supply is connected to the bottom of each of these valves um, but dynamically over time one is going to pressurize it inhibits the previous one and then the next one will be allowed to pressurize which inhibits that one etc and so you're going to get this state of pressurization that oscillates through these three elements in the circuit exactly the same thing that you see in an electrical uh, ring oscillator analog ring, ring oscillator and so if you plot the sort of pressure in pa pb and pc here that's what you see in these plots so the cyan uh, purple and orange plots and again this is their work but um, showing that just constant pressure input, you can get these oscillations. So that's really nice, right? Because if you have a sort of fluidically powered soft robot, you can you now generate sort of uh, rhythmic motions in these soft robots. And they showed some of that, and we saw the possibility for using that in our, um, in our uh, soft walking robot. So this is what happens when we create some of these valves. They don't, maybe don't look as pretty as the ones uh, that, that the Whiteside group made. There's a lot of molding, and in this case, we're not 3D printing. We've thought about 3D printing them. There's some challenges there. In this case, these are molded and assembled. Um, but what you sort of see is you see the swelling of the valves as this oscillation propagates through the circuit. And when these are connected up to the um, actuators or the, the chambers, rather, of this leg, you can get this rhythmic motion, right? Um, okay. So great, so now we have a way of generating one rhythmic motion. If we have a four-legged robot, um, how do we then uh, control the entire gate? Well, the simplest way we could come up with is essentially connect these three valves to the pairs of legs, but at different parts in the legs. So one pair of legs is moving, and then the other one starts moving. Now the ideal case, this is called um, a diagonal couplet gate, uh, which is seen in nature in things like turtles. Um, where they'll move one pair of legs and then the other, typically the phase offset between those two motions is 180 degrees, right? You want to move this one. When this one's going up, the other ones are going down and vice versa. Uh, with three of these inverter elements, we have to choose an offset of either 120 or 240 degrees, right? So because we have three chambers per leg, when this one's going 
down, that one's going up and to the right, let's say. Or when this one's going down, that one's going uh, up and to the left. Um, so that's why it looks so funny when it walks. <laughs> right? You can see it right away. It doesn't look quite efficient. And we did some, you know, if we connect it to an electrically controlled circuit, we can show that it's much more efficient if it runs at 180 degrees phase offset. So that, you know, says, well, you have to come up with a more complex circuit with two of these ring oscillators or, or some other elements. But for our purposes, it walks, and that was kind of um, a, a basic proof of concept. But then the next thing we wanted to think about is could we, how much more complexity do we have to add to start to control this walking motion? So now it can walk, and we already showed that it can handle a sort of good range of, of terrain just because of the softness of the legs, although I should say that these legs aren't so, you know, it's soft is relative, obviously. These are relatively stiff when they're pressurized as compared to, let's say, like a EcoFlex 30, if you guys have played with a really soft rubber. Um, but anyways, let's, so what do we have to add to this circuit to change the capabilities of the system? Well, the simplest thing that we could come up with is if we can add a, a 4-2 valve, meaning two inputs, four outputs, and you can switch between two pairs of outputs. Um, what we could effectively do is change the connections in two parts of the circuit. And if you have a leg that's oscillating like this with three chambers and you cha change the connection of two, what do you get? You get a reversal, right, of the motion. So we can all of a sudden go from A1, A2, A3. We um, have to externally somehow change the state of this valve, and then we're going A1, A3, A2. Okay, so... What, how do we change the state? Well, you could have something like an external sensor. And if you have this little thing, it has this, in this case, we have fluid in here because uh, air is compressible, so you need more motion. Uh, but if we have this right on the edge of flipping state and we have a fluid transmission, as soon as this thing hits the wall, um, ideally, it should change that direction of oscillation. So let's see what happens. Okay, here we're just controlling two legs. They're moving, hits the wall, and all of a sudden, it starts walking the other way. Right? This is a very, we do have a constant pressure of air coming in from here, but there's no, it's just constant air pressure. Okay, so in principle, we can change the direction. Um, we can build on that, and I keep using the wrong keyboard here. Uh, <clears throat> we can build on that, and now we can have like a manual tethered controller where we can input and add some more of these 4-2 uh, valves and essentially get this thing to um, to not only change direction of one pair of legs, but change the, the directions of two pair of legs, two pairs of legs to do things like, uh, you know, walk in a, a square here or even turn in place. Actually, turning in place is harder. You can do it with four two valves. You can control the direction. Uh, with, with two four two valves, you can control the direction. With four, you can also turn in place. Anyways, uh, so... In principle, the point is uh, we're thinking of minimum controllers that can build in some of these capabilities into the robot. Um, okay. And we were talking earlier about, I mean, obviously there's some trade-off. Uh, electrical controllers are very available, off the shelf, cheap, well-developed. So uh, certainly there's uh, building a fluidic controller to do all these things, at least the way we're doing it, is, uh, takes a lot of effort. There's a lot of nice work in microfluidics where I'm sure one could take advantage of a microfluidic controller that is running at lower pressures and then have some sort of relays to then um, drive the pressures required to move the robot. Um, so there's plenty that could be done there. Um, if someone's interested, let me know. Uh, but um, what I'll talk about now is if we take this in another direction, I talked about uh, when we have these legs moving, we can handle different terrain. And one thing that we were hoping to be able to do was to walk on sand. And um, if any of you have worked with experimental robotics, you might be able to predict what's going to happen when we try and put this thing on sand. It turns out it's a much better digger than a walker, <laughs> OK? Uh, and, and this was not just this version of the robot, but it started to motivate us to think about what are the complexities of a granular substrate. And so more recently, we actually have a project where we've leaned into this and we've started making digging robots. And I don't have too much to share about that yet. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's very interesting. There's a lot of really interesting work in granular uh, media and, and understanding the physics of granular media. 
that we can take advantage in various way, of in various ways for soft robotics. So this is moving on to the second one. So one, uh, one thing that's inspired, uh, that we're inspired by here was some work that was actually done at Cornell uh, with Hod Lipson and others while I was there, um, was to achieve variable stiffness with uh, coffee grounds or some sort of granular media in a, in this case, just in a balloon, right, in an elastic membrane. And if you've ever seen, um, you go to Ikea and you get the pre-ground coffee and it's hard as a brick, right, because it's vacuum packed, and then you cut it open and as soon as it's, you release the, the vacuum, it's soft, it's the exact same idea. If you start controlling that pressure um, inside this, again, the elastic membrane with coffee grounds, you can make a transition from behaving relatively rigid to relatively soft, and in this case, um, John Amend and others used it to uh, pick up a wide variety of objects. By the way, John started a company, Empire Robotics, uh, to develop these grippers, and they worked, but for various business reasons, the company no longer exists, but I still think it's a very cool idea. It turns out that I think, well, that's a longer story. We can, you can talk about that later if you want. Um, <clears throat> But uh, one of the ideas that we've been thinking about, and this is with Emily Lathrop, who um, came from Maryland uh, to, to San Diego, and um, <clears throat> we thought about, can we use this stiffness changing capability to improve the mobility of a more traditional robot? I guess, I don't know how traditional we can call this, but a, a, a rigid uh, kinematic linkage hexapod robot. This is an off-the-shelf robot. And so the idea was if we take these stiffness changing sort of grippers and use them as the feet of your robot, can that enable you to handle a wider variety of terrain? So for example, if you make the foot soft when you're stepping on something like loose pebbles and it conforms to the surface and then you make it rigid and then push off, can you do better than if you just had you know, rigid feet or soft feet the whole time? Um, and, and so this is, was the experiment that Emily did here. You see the robot moving. We have these little vacuum backpacks on the robot at, that are pressurizing and depressurizing the feet as they go. The feet are very, fairly small, so you can do it fairly quickly, change their stiffness state. And uh, I thought the results were pretty interesting here. On the top in that split video, we were seeing the um, jamming version versus no jamming, and the jamming version moved, moved more quickly. When I get back to that video, you'll see that. So this is walking up a seven degree slope. Uh, rigid top versus active granular bottom, sorry. So this is just rigid feet. This is these active granular feet. And you see you get much better locomotion when you're controlling the stiffness of your feet. Um, but we actually tried three cases. So there was rigid feet, active granular. And then we said as a control, we better try it with passive granular, meaning we're not actively controlling the stiffness of the feet. We're just letting the feet do whatever they're going to do uh, dynamically without uh, any pressurization. And what we actually found was these passive granular feet were the best for flat ground. So if you're walking on flat ground, I think there's an opportunity for new kind of sneakers here. Uh, we have some evidence that I think it's the weight of the robot was actually causing the stiffness change on its own without our active pumping of fluid. Um, in loose rocks, we found the active uh, granular uh, to definitely uh, be beneficial. And in wood chips, it's less clear, but we, it seems like there's some benefit there. So this was um, something Emily presented at Robosoft 2020. And, uh, and then we've also been thinking about other ways to take advantage of this kind of jamming. So the granular jamming is nice, but if you um, are interested, for example, in changing the bending stiffness of a structure. So uh, for example, we were looking at medical devices and I'll show you in a moment, the idea was, can we make a soft sh a sheet that's relatively soft? You can fold it up, put it inside the human body through a small opening, put it into place to, for example, hold the liver during a stomach um, operation, and then change its stiffness so that it can actually hold the weight of the liver, and then the surgeon can do the operation. What you could do is you could save a lot of surgeons' time, because the state of the art is you have one surgeon doing the operation, you have another surgeon holding the liver for like an hour, right? This is my understanding, I'm not a surgeon, but this is what they tell me. So um, the problem with this granular jamming is that as soon as you put it into a bending configuration, these particles can't stick together. So you're limited by just the stiffness of your membrane that's holding the whole thing together. But if you have layers of materials, uh, of, like sheets essentially, um, that have a relatively high coefficient of friction, 
you can bend these layers. They're, they're, they're thin, so they're flexible. You can bend them, and they're fairly soft. But if you then apply a vacuum or some other force to press them together, they behave like a thicker beam, and they, they're much more uh, rigid in, in bending. And then you can have a similar idea. Actually, you can chop those layers up somewhere between particles and sheets. You can have fibers. And now you can bend in multiple directions, be fairly soft, and then you, you press them together, and it's fairly stiff. So let me show you a couple of examples. This is just some uh, initial testing from a while ago. Um, there's actually other very nice work out there uh, that I, I should be showing here. But you know, there's an effect of, for example, the coefficient of friction. If you're using pressure, you also want layers with a nice coefficient of friction, so they stick together well when they're pressed together. Um, but you can also use electrostatics or other mechanisms to, to do this transition. We did some nice, well, I think, uh, uh, Sarab Jadhav, I should say, a uh, student in my group did some nice modeling of how does this stiffness change as you start to apply more force. You start to overcome the sort of friction force that's preventing these layers from moving relative to one another. And so if you have a beam, you, uh, any mechanical engineers should know that the higher tr highest transverse shear stress that you're going to get anywhere in a, in a beam is right in the middle. And so that's the layer that will first start to slip. And so you'll transition from one stiffness to another one. And then in that new beam, you'll have another uh, layer that will have the highest uh, transverse shear stress, and that one will slip, et cetera. So you get this sort of multilinear effect. But if the coefficient of friction of, for static and, and, and uh, dynamic friction are similar, then it, it smooths it out. So anyways, this is a very brief version of the model. Here's some experimental results that show this sort of much more smooth but kind of changing stiffness curve. Um, but practically, what does this mean? What can we do with this? This is uh, a version of this device that I mentioned that we're now working on commercializing with um, uh, some, some collaborators, a company called Biojam Technologies. Um, and basically this, and I should warn you, if you just ate lunch and you're squeamish, feel free to look away because we're going to put this inside the stomach of a pig. Um, but this is showing uh, how this device can work, right? You can sort of fold it up, put it through the trocar, and you can see... It's fairly soft and flexible. You can manipulate this device with surgical manipulators, as you see here. And then you pull a vacuum, and it's jammed, and it's going to be more rigid. That's not, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a limit to the high end and the low end of the, of the stiffness that you can get there. But now we can take this device, uh, put it in through a trocar, which is the opening uh, that surgeons will use for minimally invasive surgery, put this device in the stomach, and this is... My understanding is this is what it would normally look like. If you want to operate on the stomach, there's the liver hanging on top of it. So you have to pull that up and out of the way to do any sort of operation on the stomach. Um, here you see the, the surgeon moving this device. We've added these sort of features to allow you to easily grab the device with surgical tools. We have a high friction surface on one side of the device and to, so that it can sort of um, hold in place uh, to the abdominal cavity and then you can manipulate other things underneath and start to do a surgery. Okay, so I'll, I'll move on just uh, for, for anyone who doesn't want to watch this, but feel free, I can, we can uh, point you to a link where you can see more details. Okay, so, so that's the layer jamming and one of the possibilities we see there. And then fiber jamming, this is another uh, paper that Sarah led where he looked at uh, the application of a haptic device. So could we make a glove that appears stiffer in, in one configuration and softer in another. So you can imagine if you're manipulating objects, current haptic devices for virtual reality, for example, are often using vibration, which um, can provide feedback in, you know, can provide illusions well in some scenarios and less well in others. This is one that will actually resist the motion of your hand when the device is jammed. And, um, and then in this application, Sarab is picking up these balloons and then popping them on a cactus, and all of a sudden the, the feeling that the balloon disappears, right? So um, I think it's a it's kind of interesting uh, possibility there for, for uh, haptic devices, but for other, uh, on the top you see kind of using it as a tool. Okay, so... <clears throat> okay, so I'll talk about um, uh, swimming now. And uh, this is an area, oops, my apologies. Uh, this is an area that we've, we've been thinking about the underwater space and how a soft body can potentially be beneficial. 
Um, we previously, what I'm showing here is some previous work that we did where we uh, looked at, the, this is actually a real organism, an eel, juvenile eels can evade predation by being just really hard to see, basically. They're transparent. And, um, and it's like a ribbon, right? And so similarly, we wanted to design an actuated ribbon that could generate these sort of uh, sinusoidal uh, propagations of actuation through the body. In this case, again, we kind of came up with a minimal example where we have three segments. And we developed a, a new kind of electrostatic actuator that essentially um, uses uh, fluid as the electrode on both sides. But the way these actuators basically work is if you charge up, if you have a soft body, and you charge up um, the top and the bottom of that body, the charges will attract one another and compress that body so you can get mechanical actuation. Um, so we thought this was very exciting. This is from a few years ago. Uh, and actually, we, the truth is we developed this and then found the eel that sort of matched it. So this wasn't <laughs> honestly bio-inspired, um, but there is certainly some example for how to swim in this way. We, um, but the challenge is that it was relatively slow, right? So this thing was fairly large scale, and you can speed up uh, electrostatic actuators. And actually, Rob Wood's group at Harvard has uh, started to do this. The way that you do that, essentially, is you make thinner and thinner layers and more of them. So then you don't have to apply quite as high a voltage across each of the layers, because if it's very thin, you can get the same uh, electrical field with much lower voltage. And then you can make very fast electro uh, uh, dielectrical elastomer actuators. Um, but we, uh, but th there's all sorts of technical challenges involved there. So rather than pushing this direction, one of the things we've been thinking about for sort of swimming soft robots is can we use a more traditional actuation mechanism and still take advantage of a kind of soft-bodied swimming? Um, the model organism that we're using in this case, which is more honestly bio-inspired, uh, is a cephalopod uh, that uses jet propulsion. And basically, uh, the way that this works is they suck water into their mantle through, um, they have actually various uh, places where they can bring the water in, and then they close off these valves, and then they um, contract their muscles to contract the mantle and force water out of a jet. And so, and, and then you can do this repeatedly and create jet propulsion, right? And some of the advantages of doing this, well, for one, if you're a fish and you have to push on the water, you actually require a lot of structural support. So you need like a rigid skeleton. Um, and, and there's, there's a, a fair amount of force involved there. When you're doing this kind of jet propulsion, your whole body can be soft. Now, what I'm going to show you isn't entirely soft, but that's at least one of the motivations. Uh, so the other thing is the squid takes advantage of the added mass effect, meaning how much wide it, water it carries along with it as it swims. And, um, and what it wants to do is when it's creating a jet of water, it wants to be as streamlined as possible. When it's sucking in water, it's, for whatever reason, sucking it in from the rear, which will tend to slow it down, decelerate it. So it wants to have as much added mass as possible when it's actually filling its mantle and as little as possible when it's jetting forward. So it has the slowest rate of deceleration, the fastest rate of forward acceleration. Um, and then you get this, uh, yeah, so the added mass is reduces the water's expelled, and it's jet propulsion, right? So there's been a couple of previous examples of groups that have worked on this, at least when we started, Weymouth et al. had um, made this kind of one-shot version just to show how storing up this elastic energy in the body and then releasing it to the water can be very fast, right? And then Cecilia Lashke's group um, that was in Italy, Cecilia Lashke has now moved to Singapore, but they had developed this um, version of a soft-bodied cephalopod swimmer where they actually did show that they're achieving this, that they have the nice vortex ring that's shedding during this jet propulsion. Um, and it was cyclic, they could repeat it unlike the other one, but the, the, the shape of the body is relatively, they're, they're sort of pulling on strings to compress the body, but the overall projected frontal area was similar. Um, so we wanted to think of what's a simple, robust mechanism that you could change the projected front of, frontal area to get this added mass effect, and you could do that repeatedly. And it was actually an undergraduate who came up with this very simple mechanism, which was surprisingly effective. And basically, it was, I think it was inspired by actually an undergraduate design class that we have. Um, but the, we ended up having this little rack and pinion driven by a traditional electromechanical motor. And it's a de decimated pinion, so 
it essentially turns and compresses the body. We have these ribs that expand outwards that sort of buckle outwards when you compress the body. And then once, the, um, once you run out of teeth on your little pinion here, then it slips back to the original state. So you get this uh, cyclic compression and uh, expansion of the body. And if we put dye in the body, you can see the sort of uh, vortex ring that we, we get out of this robot when we fire. And um, this is, I'll, I'll show you in a moment, the actual untethered robot, but this is what the velocity of the robot might look like during the jet period. We have the teeth slip, the velocity increases, and then as we refill, the velocity decreases. Right? Okay. So what are the key design parameters for this kind of uh, robot? Well, there's lots of really nice work that's been done in fluid, uh, by fluid mechanicians who've looked at um, the similar jet propulsion with a more of a rigid structure by pumping water out of a syringe. And it turns out that the key parameter is how much water you pump out, which is defined by the length of the syringe, um, divided by the diameter of the jet that you create, which is defined in this case by the diameter of the syringe. So this um, stroke ratio, essentially, L over D, um, is important because from the fluid dynamics perspective, and again, this is not coming from a fluid dynamics person, but essentially you want as much of that water as possible to be enwrapped into one vortex ring. That has the maximum amount of mass transfer into the flow. Whereas if, you, if the stroke ratio, uh, ideally for a stationary flow, should be about four. And if you're very far from four, well, you'll see in a moment what happens. Um, so one of the interesting things with this robotic platform is we were actually able to test, for example, different stroke ratios. In this case, it's hard to change the volume of the robot, but you could easily change the size of the jet by changing the nozzle. And so if we look at the um, leftmost case here, you see that we're going to actually have multiple vortex rings coming off out of this one flow. So we're trying to force too much water through too little of an opening, and it's not a very efficient transfer of momentum. Similar in the second one, you kind of have these multiple vortex rings. In the third one, which is this is as close uh, to the ideal stroke ratio as we could get, you have this one single vortex ring. And when we do, and then when we measure the average thrust for these different um, nozzle diameters um, <clears throat> at different motor voltages, which approximate the, the frequency of actuation, uh, above, uh, you know, a certain, once we get to a certain reasonable rate of, uh, of frequency, the black is always on top, meaning your largest um, and closest to a stroke ratio of four was always, uh, always provided the most average thrust. And then we can measure this thrust over time. So we could sort of measure the platform in the stationary format, but then of course, if we're interested in making a swimming robot, we wanted to look at this thing untethered. And so we could do this in the simplest case by adding a little uh, compartment here, which contains a battery and in this case, actually, it's just very simple control. We just are sort of turning on a circuit and running the motor. Um, we, uh, we are now working on how to get to something that's more controlled, control the rate of actuation as, as well as control the direction. But what we showed in this, um, in this preliminary work here was, sure enough, we could swim, and we actually were able to try different stroke ratios and find that, that the stroke ratio of four uh, predicted from the fluid mechanics also gave us the fastest swimming speed as well as the fastest average thrust. And then the other thing is if we added a, I should have these videos on, on loop, if we added a jet that's permanently angled to one side, a nozzle rather that's permanently angled to one side, we could get um, thrust vectoring, so essentially control the steering. Um, in this case, as I say, this is, we didn't, we're not controlling the angle, that's something that, I'm, that we're currently working on. Um, okay. And then, of course, one of the uh, great things about being at UC San Diego is we have the Scripps Institution for Oceanography, and they have the Birch Aquarium, which is open to the public, um, and they're very generous in allowing us to test some of our robots there. So here we have this robot swimming in the tank. You see the divers doing some, uh, I think they're cleaning the tank or something like that, but they, they let us put the robot in at the same time, and we have a camera in the front, so we're able to capture some video and the idea is that you can do some sort of environmental monitoring with this kind of system without disturbing the animals and without worried about getting tethered, you know, caught, propellers caught in some sort of seaweed or something like that, getting stuck somewhere. So um, as I say, there are still a lot of rigid components here, but sort of working towards a, a more soft robotic swimmer. Um, 
we're, we're at, uh, you know, 15 minutes now, so I think I'm not going to talk about adhesion. If there's questions, I'm very happy to come back to that. Um, but we have thought a little bit about adhesion. Let me just go to... just go to the end here. So, so we've thought a little bit about some bio-inspired adhesion and some interesting phenomena that happens when you vibrate a disc near a surface. Very happy to talk more of those, but I want to respect people's time and leave some time for questions. Um, I'll just say that uh, we have a lot of fantastic collaborators that we've worked with on this various projects at UC San Diego, Qualcomm, um, some companies, uh, various sources of funding that we're very excited to, uh, to have. Uh, but most importantly, I want to highlight some of the fantastic students that have been working on these projects. Um, so Dylan Drotman, uh, now Dr. Dylan Drotman worked on a lot of the walking uh, soft-legged robots. Emily Lathrop, I mentioned, worked on these uh, variable stiffness feet. Dr. Saurabh Jad have worked on the variable stiffness uh, fiber jamming actuators. Um, <laughs> Caleb, Dr. Caleb Christensen, I had to add on to the Zoom call, uh, who also happens to love Star Wars. Uh, was the one who did this uh, eel robot, uh, and Will did the, um, Dr. William uh, Hakes, Weston Docks, did the stiffness changing uh, surgical device, as well as some other things. Well, these people have all done other things that I haven't talked about, and Dr. Jess Sandoval worked on adhesion. Um, and most importantly, I was very fortunate. This was uh, just this spring. Uh, we were able to get people together on campus and finally do a graduation ceremony. I got a bunch of them together. Some of them weren't able to make it. Uh, but you might, if any of you are in the position to hire, you might see some of these people soon. So keep an eye out for them. And thank you, thank you all for your attention. So uh, before we open up the, the floor for questions, we have a little gift. And so uh, I know some of your research is inspired by uh, turtles. Uh, and it <laughs> happens that the mascot of University of Maryland is a terrapin turtle. Yeah. And so this is uh, for you. And our Thank you so for coming out here. Thank you so much. That's beautiful. It is really great, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, we're going to open up the floor for questions. Then for people online, you can use the, uh, the Q&A function to submit questions. And we're going to get a few of those. Uh, but for now, any questions from the audience? So, uh, can I start with it? And Thank you. So, uh, in, the, in the haptic uh, interface that you're using, is it, uh, is it about both things, or is uh, you know, from the simulation to the user? Or can it go from the user to the simulation as well, in terms of applying a particular force? I see. So in that case, with the haptic glove, we let me just bring it up quickly to, to my, remind people here. Um, <clears throat> This was sort of a, a demonstration we did, um, frankly, because Saurabh was very excited about uh, VR. And uh, by the way, he just started a job at Apple. Uh, so um, hopefully we'll see more uh, from this direction from him. But um, in this case, it was one way. So the simulation, he was interacting with the environment. So in that sense, it's two way. Uh, based on the, um, uh, how was he? Did yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to remember how he was detecting the position of his hand. I think we had motion capture here. Um, but there was no sensors on the device. So you were talking about measuring forces. We weren't sort of measuring forces. We were measuring positions of the hand, certainly. Um, but this was more of a demonstration of these jamming devices. Actually, um, Sarab did some fantastic work during his, during his PhD. He did a master's and PhD with me, and he actually designed a whole CAD design interface in VR where you could actually couple it to a finite element um, analysis. So you could design something like a, a car chassis and also do sort of structural testing on that space frame chassis. And, um, and we had the hardest time published. We're still trying to get that published because it's like in the middle of everything. It's the VR people are like, oh, okay, that's interesting. And then, anyways, but he did, he, so he's gone really in depth into how to implement this in VR. But I think your question is about the sensing, and, and we just used um, uh, motion capture. Thanks. Yeah. Sorry, maybe in the back first, and then Derek. Um, so your RoboSquid had very nice vortex rings, which I appreciate. 
Do the bio squids make vortex springs when they jet, or is it a turbulent jet? Do you know? Uh, yeah, so now we're pushing the boundaries of, of my uh, fluid dynamics knowledge. Um, my understanding was that squids do generate vortex jets, um, but uh, I would accept that I could be proven false there. Um, I, and it probably also has to do with, so as I said, with the squid, they actually are bringing water in in multiple places, but shooting it out through a jet, but they can also control the shape of their jet. And so maybe there's some um, situations where when they're swimming nice and straight and, you know, laminar flow, maybe it's a prettier vortex, but yeah, I'm not exactly sure, to be honest. Cool. Uh, Derek? Yeah, thanks. Uh, great talk, Mike. I, I'm thinking about this high-pressure supply that some of these um, devices require, and thinking about in the underwater domain, you have ample pressure as long as you have an internal low-pressure, like, cavity. So have you thought at all about how you might take advantage of that in the underwater domain to drive some of these microfluidic systems? Yeah, thanks, Derek. That's a fantastic uh, question, and you're absolutely right. If you took something that at um, atmospheric, you know, on land was kind of normal pressure, and you take it, the further down you get, the more pressurized it is, right? No, but there's a, a big challenge that happens, which is, if your pressurized body, so a lot of fish have a swim bladder, right? And submarines do the same, you know, control their, their depth that way by changing, you know, they have some body of air that they can change, they can compress essentially to change the net density of the, the thing. Um, the problem when you have a soft swim bladder is there's this instability that happens, which is as you go down, your soft slim swim bladder compresses, which means you get more dense which means you want to sink to the bottom of the ocean, right? So I think you're right that if you have some one way of controlling your um, buoyancy that is maybe a rigid thing like a submarine, and then you also have a soft bladder, you could kind of get this free compressing of air. Um, but if you just had the soft bladder, yes, you could drive circuits with it, but you might run into that instability where you get really heavy and sink, depending on how you're, I guess, de depending on if you're net denser than water once that thing compresses. Anyway, so just to say that we've thought about it, there's some complexities there, but I, I really like that idea, and maybe we can, um, yeah, you could drive, you get all your energy to drive the circuits just off of going down, that'd be cool. Yeah, I guess it'd be sort of equivalent to if you had a high pressure canister or something at sea level, and you would have a steady high pressure supply in in the undersea domain, you have sort of a low pressure vacuum. It's just it's the pressure differential. I think yeah. That you need. Yeah. I'm just wondering if you need to add energy to maintain that pressure differential over time, or if you kind of just get it for free. Right. I mean. I think probably the short answer is you never get energy for free, but you could take advantage of your converting. Yeah, you're, you're essentially storing up energy as you go down. That doesn't cost you anything because it's just you just need weight to, to generate that. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is at some point you have to get back up. So as long as you have some source of energy to get back up, then you're good, or or to change your density so that takes you back up. The interesting thing about underwater when we started interacting with some of these people at Scripps is a lot of underwater um, AUVs or underwater robotic systems can be very efficient, like these gliders just because all they have to do is change their density and then they sink, but then if you put foils, hydrofoils on the side, you can actually go a long distance in, during that sinking and then you change your density and again you come up. That can be very efficient. So when you start talking about, oh, I'm gonna make a swimmer, and, and I guess you probably have thought about this as well, I'm gonna make a swimmer that is very efficient, you're sort of competing with that unless, of course, you you know have to maintain depth or whatever. There's some other motivation. I don't know, how do you, how do you normally get a, around being compared to, to underwater gliders? I mean, we, well, my PhD was on underwater gliders, so I'm very familiar with that. I mean, I think, I think what's nice about the gliders is that, you know, especially in aerospace, right, it's the lift. It's, a, it's an aerospace phenomenon that yeah. we study here. Um, but, but, yeah, I'm just thinking about, you know, the, in the soft robotic domain, having to have that high-pressure supply, that little tube that you pointed out mm -hmm. in all the videos. Um, if there was a way in the underwater domain sounds like at the end of the day, you just 
buildings to add energy into the system in some way, whether it's to change your depth or to um, reinvest in that pressure differential? I think so, and but I think there's another practical challenge, which is just yeah, having being air powered in a soft body means that you're um, you're you're going to be severely compressed as you go down in depth, right? So the counter, the way that we've dealt with that so far, and we've worked on this um, everting robot that uh, sort of grows underwater to explore coral reefs, which I didn't talk about. But the way we got around it there was we just used the surrounding fluid balance pressure with the surrounding fluid and then use that as our as our um, transmission fluid. Um, so we've always kind of gone away from using air underwater, but you're making me think maybe there is some opportunity we're missing there, I'm not sure. Well, maybe there's potential energy you could store in the structure, in the flexible structure that you kind of interleave with the potential energy and the pressure differential. Right. Cool. Okay, well maybe we can talk more. Awesome. All right. Well, so we are, we got 30 seconds. So I'm going to, oh, there is one question online. What, uh, yeah, all right. a question. We have one question online and then we're going to call it. So what model, like PCC approximation or FPM did you use to model the soft line? Yeah. So um, the, the, the question is, how do we model these soft legs? And are we using a constant curvature model, I think is what they're asking. Or... Um, you know, people have lo looked at various sort of beam models uh, to model soft bending robots. Um, when, you know, actually, the honest truth is in a lot of the stuff I showed today, we haven't used a lot of models. In the first case, we did assume constant curvature, where I showed just the, the actuator and the tip position. We basically assumed with this pressure differential, we get a constant curvature set of beams and figure out the Ford Kinemax that way. Um, Often these soft structures do not have constant curvatures and they're not nice Bernoulli beams. So you have uh, uh, kind of other models that you can use to compensate for that. But I mean, the thing that I'm most excited about, I think with soft robots is the more general case of something that is really soft and squishy in all dimensions. So if you have a beam that's bending, um, it's nicer for modeling and if you can you know, model your entire soft robot as made up of beams that bend, that's great, but that generally assumes infinite stiffness or, you know, no, no softness in, in the sort of uh, lengthwise direction. Whereas if you have a soft blob, then actually modeling, you can't use those kinds of simplifications. Um, but I think when you can make those some kinds of simplifications, you absolutely should, because then you can get a more, more efficient model. That's a good question. Awesome. All right, so we are going to call it, and so let's give a big round of applause for our speaker.